Hi, I think most of you probably know me already, but if you don't, my name is Taran and welcome to a British audiophile. Today I'm going to be reviewing the Fine Audio F700 speakers that you see behind me on the stands. Now, Fine Audio is a relatively new speaker manufacturer, but it's a breakaway organization from one of the oldest speaker manufacturers in the world, Tannoy. It was formed in 2017 when a bunch of ex Tannoy employees got together to form Fine Audio including their technical director, Dr. Paul Mills. And I have to say from the onset, since starting this channel, these are hands down the most beautiful looking speakers that I've seen. So let's see if they sound anywhere near as good as they look. The Fine Audio F700s retail for £2,499 in the UK. They're available in Piano Gloss White, Piano Gloss Black, and the Piano Gloss Walnut that I'm reviewing today. They measure 348 by 224 by 337 millimeters and weigh nine kilograms. Imperial measurements would be 13.7 by 8.8 .8 by 13.3 inches and 19.8 pounds. It has curved cabinets with rounded edges, but it's the details that sets the build and finish of the F700s apart from the competition in my opinion. The thickness of the bottom aluminium plinth which supports the chunky chrome feet which in turn suspends the cabinet. The chrome detailing on the bezel that surrounds the midwoofer. The way that the discreetly engraved aluminium fine audio logo is inlaid into the cabinet itself. The grain of the walnut veneer seems to be of a superior standard than you ordinarily get or it could just be that it's finished with nine coats of hand painted lacquer. Regardless the overall fit and finish is akin to fine quality furniture. Premium materials extend to the inside as well. The entire F700 range have cabinets constructed from birch plywood. It's a lot more expensive, harder to work with, but it's supposed to have superior acoustic properties than the ubiquitous MDF. The F700 is a downward firing ported design which incorporates their conical bass tracks diffuser to assist airflow. KEF have UniQ, ELAC Unify, Fine Audio's dual concentric coaxial or point source driver, take your choice which term you prefer, is called isoflare. The mix of multi-fiber materials used to form the 150mm or 6 inch mid woofer cone are a closely guarded secret. They've been selected for their rigidity and damping qualities. At 1700 Hz it hands over duties to the centrally located magnesium cone compression tweeter. It's a horn loaded design that should be able to give you up to 10 times the efficiency of a conventional cone tweeter. The rear has two sets of decent quality speaker binding posts to facilitate by amping. There's even a grounding terminal to assist you to further reduce incoming RFI. I just want to talk about the advantages and the disadvantages of a dual concentric or coaxial design. That's typically where you have a tweeter housed in the center of a midwoofer. It was popularized by Tannoy in the middle part of the last century, an awful long time ago, although I don't think that Tannoy can actually lay claim to inventing it. It's a popular design with Tannoy, Kef, Elac, and the fine audio speakers that I'm reviewing here today. And the main benefit is that it acts like a point source or as close to a point source as we're capable of developing. It helps to reduce a problem that plagues conventional speakers where you have drivers in different locations across the front baffle. And that problem is comb filtering. Comb filtering happens around the crossover frequency where you've got two or potentially more drivers, but generally two drivers, playing the same frequency. And because you're unlikely to be sitting directly on axes to both of those drivers, the time it takes for that signal to arrive to your ear from each driver is different. And that causes phase cancellation, effectively cancelling out certain frequencies. Point sources are quite effective at dealing with this problem. And the essential benefits, if done correctly, are that they can have a much wider sweet spot and a much better off-axis performance. The disadvantages are that it's a lot more complex to build. You've essentially got to house the tweeter in the center of the midwoofer with its own motor structure, voice coil, diaphragm, and whatever delivery mechanism it has to get the sound out, whether it's a conventional dome or a compression horn tweeter, which is what we have here. Also, the midwoofer cone itself acts like a waveguide to the tweeter. 
and it's not static, it's moving, and that can cause another type of distortion, sometimes referred to as Doppler distortion. Because you've got a cavity running through the center of the midwoofer, it can't have as substantial a motor structure or the same cone radiating surface. That means that a dual concentric driver compared to a conventional driver of the same size can suffer from having reduced dynamics and not quite the same base extension. The crossover is going to be a little bit contentious. It's hand built in the factory in Scotland. Nothing contentious about that. It's got a second order filter on the woofer, a first order filter on the tweeter. Again, nothing to complain about there either. What's going to get some people excited one way or the other is that after it's built, it's sent to an external company to be deep cryogenically tested. And that's supposed to relieve micro stresses in the components themselves. Some people will believe it makes a difference. Others will not. All that I can tell you is that it's been confirmed to me that Fine Audio did their own blind listening test in-house and they were very conclusive in the fact that it made a sonic difference. Seems an awful lot of trouble to go to just for some kind of spurious marketing claim. It's clear that Fine weren't going for a one-size-fits-all approach with the F700s. It has the kind of sound that will really seduce particular types of listeners and other types of listeners, not so much. If you listen to simpler, more laid back types of music, whether it's your more intimate jazz, soul, blues, acoustic instruments, male or female vocals, it has a real body and richness low down that's balanced beautifully with a liveliness and an energy on top without sounding bright or shrill that quite frankly, I've only ever heard from really good horn speakers. They're not the last word in speed and dynamics. So those of you who listen to a lot of rock music, large classical works, electronic music, quite frankly, anything with a lot going on and a lot of fast successive transients, there'll be other options out there that will suit you better. The bass has very good extension for a speaker this size. They're 6 dB down at around 40 Hertz. I'm sure that can be attributed to the downward firing bass tracks port. And I wouldn't expect them to compete with the likes of the Bucar S400s or the Triangle Genes trios in terms of scale and dynamics. They're much bigger speakers. But when I compare them to my Proac Response 1SCs, which have a similar size internal volume, the Proacs have a little bit more mid bass punch and they're certainly a little bit more agile in the bass as well. That little bit of bloom in the bass does mean that the leading edges of notes in the mid-range are ever so slightly obscured. There certainly isn't the same level of clarity and instrument separation with the F700s that my Proax have, but there's something glorious about the tonal richness and texture from a horn tweeter if done right, and that's what I think we have here. It's even better than the Triangle Genes trios that I reviewed some months ago. Sure, there's a little bit of coloration, a slight nasal quality sometimes, but nothing really to complain about. It's very well refined and very controlled on the whole. And in comparison to the finest speakers around this price point, my Proax and the ATC SEM 19s, well, they just sound a little dull and flat in the mid-range compared to the F700s. Don't let me give you the impression that these speakers are bright, they're not. Sibilance is very well controlled. And if anything, these speakers are a touch rolled off right at the highest frequencies. Certainly my Proax have more high-end extension. The ATC SEM 19s that I reviewed recently and my Proax both have a little bit more of that airy spatial quality. The party trick of the F700s is how evenly they load the room with sound. There's good sound stage width, good sound stage depth. And within that sound stage, it's clear where you can locate instruments, something that I refer to as imaging but it's the size of the sweet spot, whether you move left or right, forward or backwards, or even up and down. Now, this is something that you'd expect from a well-implemented dual concentric or coaxial driver, and that's exactly what we have. Even when you walk around the room, you get less tonal variation than with many other speakers. Now, this section is gonna be relatively straightforward because I think the F700s are about as a room agnostic and as forgiving of amplification as any speaker you're likely to get. The only thing I'd pay particular attention to is to move them away from walls. They do have a little bit of that fullness, bloominess in the bass. By moving them away from walls, the bass does tighten up. If measuring from the front baffle, I had them a good meter from the front baffle to the wall behind the speakers. 
In terms of listening at low levels, they're okay. They're not the worst I've heard. They're not the best. They're not like the Bukar S400s that you really need to crank up before they get going. But that dual concentric driver does need a little bit of volume before it starts to sound engaging. They're certainly not as good as my Proact Response 1 SCs at low level listening. And it's a similar story with the near field setup if you're listening at the end of a desk. They're not a head in the vice type of speaker. If you move your head a couple of inches left or right, the tonality isn't going to change. That's the virtue of that dual concentric coaxial driver. But you want to be a good meter or at least away from that horn tweeter, otherwise it does start to sound a little bit aggressive. I tried the F700s with a whole bunch of different amplifiers and believe it or not, my favorite was the Hegel H95. It has a very even tonality that allowed all the virtues of the F700 to shine through and drove these speakers perfectly. When I stepped up to the Hegel H160, I did get a little bit more scale and dynamics, but not that much. I just felt that the Hegel H95 had a more even tonality that better suited the F700s. Moving up to my Exposure 21 Pre and 18 Super Mono Blocks, I'd expect even more scale and dynamics and tonal richness. And that isn't what I got. It's as if I got the worst traits out of the Exposure and the F700s. It sounded warm and fuzzy. That happens sometimes. I tried the tonally cooler ATC CDA2 Mark II Pre and P1 Power Amp with the F700s and they work really well together. Although I did feel at almost four times the price of the Hegel H95, the difference in performance was not justified by the difference in price. Finally, I tried the Wilsington R8 tube amplifier that's currently in for review. Now that review is pending, so I won't say too much, but I will say this, that amplifier in ultra linear mode run by KT88 power tubes is not warm and cozy sounding and it worked really well with the F700s. The fine F700 speakers are for those people who appreciate something that's aesthetically beautiful, finished superbly and made from premium quality materials and are prepared to pay a little bit extra for it. Is it going to compete sonically with the best speakers I've heard for two, two and a half K? Well, not quite, but it's not that far behind. It's going to appeal to those listeners who basically aren't chasing the last word in detail and dynamics, want something that's warm and rich sounding down below with a little bit of life and vigor up top without sounding bright and aggressive. It's very forgiving of amplification, so you can get away with spending a little bit less on your amplifier and a little bit more on your speakers. As long as you don't choose something on the warm side of neutral in terms of partnering equipment, you're gonna be absolutely fine. And it's gonna be very forgiving of the room which you place it in and to some extent, the position you locate it within that room. And for all of those reasons, it's very much worth a recommended from this channel. So that's it from me. All that remains for me to say is if you like this video, please hit that like button, please share it. If you like what I'm doing with this channel and you haven't subscribed already, please consider subscribing and check me out on Patreon. Any financial support you can offer there is greatly appreciated. I have some additional services that I offer as well in terms of consultancy and some Patreon only videos. So for today, for now, a British audiophile, signing off. <laughs>